Excuse me? I am programmed to always be looking for the next big score. You're programmed to do as I say. I am programmed to ask for random stuff. You're not programmed to ask me. You son of a bitch. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. What's the job? I'm in. I'm out. I quit. Whose kidneys are these? Welcome to my advanced guide for Stellaris 3.0. The main focus of this episode is your first ascension perk and your factions. For a full list of chapters, check out the description below. Welcome back to the Othethi Interplanetary Assembly, the year is 2210, and now we're playing with Stellaris 3.0.3. .3. So there have been some changes. The first main change I'm going to address is the change to Crime Lord deal. Well, now the Crime Lord deal provides two criminal jobs and an extra criminal job per 33 planet crime. Does this mean we shouldn't take the Crime Lord deal? Well, let's have a look. So the first thing is, we're now missing two population, which are going to be working as criminals. They're going to still require upkeep. They will, however, be reducing trade value by five. That currently means our capital has gone from producing somewhere in the region of seven or eight trade value to a negative two and a half. So it's, it's basically producing none. This, uh, this, this does still give us 10 stability. In this particular run, because I already have the Crime Lord deal, I'm not going to end the Crime Lord deal because what that would do is it would give me minus 10 stability for 10 years, which overall would be a 20 stability swing, which would lose me 12% output on all of, my, all of my pops. Instead, I'm just going to keep these two pops here as criminals because I, I don't want to lose take that big stability hit for such a long period of time. However, I have other planets. Let's look here at Tritonis. Well, Tritonis is just upgraded to have the uh, planetary administration, the planetary capital is upgraded. So I can unemploy my enforcer, unemploy some administrators, remove the governor. If we just tick over a day or so, well, look, we've got crime. Let's think about negotiating with the crime lords. Well, let's try it out. So I'm going to negotiate with the Crime Lords and then I will restore the jobs. I will put my leader back in. Now the first thing you'll notice, I had one unemployed pop here. That pop's actually jumped down to criminal stratum. Oh no, is there anything I can do about these criminals? Yes, there is. If I set priority to my workers, the criminals will jump into that worker job. Now this will only work because if I go to my capital, I can set my priority between the, the different uh, stratums. All it will do will set uh, an order of priority that goes like this. Your, uh, your high priority job first, then the criminal job, then all other jobs. So on a planet where you only have one type of worker, for instance, this planet where I only have technicians, and I'm probably only going to have technicians in the worker role for the foreseeable future, on this plan, I can uh, prioritize a worker and that will be fine. It's also probably important to prioritize a specialist. Uh, and that way, what I can do here is uh, I can make sure that I can get some of these workers to populate up into a prioritized specialist rather than going for criminals when I build a building on the planet. Now, the building I'm, I'm going to build here, at this point, I've only really got three choices. Either I build an alloy foundry. Now, what that's going to do is it's going to increase my alloy production at the cost of some minerals. I can also build a research lab, which is going to increase my research at the cost of some consumer goods. Or the third option, which is I could build an industrial district, which is going to provide me a mixture of minerals and uh, of alloys and consumer goods. At the moment, I am buying in six consumer goods per month at a cost of 2.6. So if I do that, uh, let's have a look at what it's going to cost me. So these are producing eight energy per pop. If I move one of these up to producing a consumer good, the, then I will, uh, this balance here, this plus six that I'm buying each month, well, I can ignore that because I'll be producing an extra six. And that is going to cost me a total of 15.6. So as long as my technicians produce less than 15.6, it's worth popping one of those up into that job. So actually that is the building I'm going to build here, an industrial district. Now, whilst that is going to reduce my overall planetary capacity, I'm, I'm only now going to begin to worry about planetary cap. Now, something else that's changed uh, with this new patch is population growth. So 
You'll notice here on my capital, my base growth is now only plus 4.5 per month. So this is because uh, biological races have received somewhat of a nerf. When you set the, uh, the sliders at the start of the game in the game menu for, pl uh, for population growth, the defaults are now maximum 1.5 times uh, base growth is the maximum logistic growth you can get. You could slide that up to two like we had before 3.0.3. And you can put that all the way down to zero, which will, in essence, ignore logistic pop growth until you get negative modifiers. So what this will mean, actually, is that my my planets, my planetary capacity is no longer as important to keep that high at the 80 level as before. Now, at a planetary capacity of only 52, you can achieve this maximum pop growth of 1.5. The caveat there is you have to have exactly 26 population to do so, but uh, but 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 now planetary capacity above 52 is uh, is is the, is good, and the Goldilocks zone you're looking at somewhere in the mid 60s, uh, whereas before you were looking at uh, 68 for max capacity, and then looking at somewhere in the in the early 80s, it's uh, it's now kind of shifted down somewhat to get to that plus 1.5. And now we've had some factions forming. So let's go over and check out the faction tab so we can interact with these cool factions. So generally, factions tend to form when you encounter an alien civilization for the first time. And that will usually happen around the year 10 to 15. Um, I don't actually know if it's related, but, uh, but uh, that, that generally is the rough time you get. So factions have some approval level. Well, first off, let's start at the beginning. They have some ethos, so an ethic in in your empire not necessarily a governing ethic but an ethic in your empire is what they who they represent so i have a militarist faction an egalitarian faction and a spiritualist faction if we look at my civics i have egalitarian xenophile and militarist so it's interesting that i don't currently have a faction for the uh for the xenophiles but but that's uh, that they'll probably crop up eventually and then i have for my factions i have approval i can see the size of the faction in terms of number of pops as well as the support for that faction. Uh, and then I can see here a quick rundown of the issues they have and whether I'm pleasing them, which is the positive circles, or the red circles if I'm not pleasing them, uh, pleasing some form of issue they've got. And those will also appear on the left-hand side here. And then on top of that, I here find out how much influence I'm getting from that faction. So the way that it, it the influence is calculated is it is the support of the faction multiplied by their approval uh, and then that is the fraction of influence you get from uh, a maximum at this stage i believe it's a maximum of two influence i could be getting from my factions and then when i'm not quite getting two i've got very high approval here with my egalitarian faction i'm ticking off everything on their list anti-autocratic free movement reproductive freedoms anti-stratification but my other factions, for instance, the militarist faction, well, they want me to have a local rivalry and they uh, would also, they're not unhappy about it, but they would prefer if I had some conquest and imperial hegemony. Uh, they're also happy that I'm not not allowing to have uh, unrestricted warfare as my policy. So I can't actually really boost their approval without rivaling a neighbor. And at this point, I don't really want to annoy the Rakudon Stella hegemony because I'd like to not go to war with them for a little while. Then I've also got here the Church of Religious Conservationism, the Spiritualists. Well, what are they upset by? First off, they're upset that I haven't banned robots. They're upset that I don't have spiritualism in my empire, in my governing ethics, and they'd prefer that at least 25% of people were spiritualists like them. These two factions at the moment I can't really do anything about, uh, and my, my faction here is generally happy. Usually, you would go to your policies and you'd change a policy around. For instance, Purge, uh, might be set to displacement. Well, if you move that over to prohibited, the egalitarian faction and the xenophile faction would probably be quite happy with that. Uh, as well as at the moment I've set refugees to welcome, which I suspect is something they are quite happy with. I uh, know that'd be the xenophile faction, which I, I haven't got yet. But on top of that, any pops following the this faction, if it's, if it's turned to green, uh, they're going to get a bonus to their happiness. Uh, on yellow, they're going to get no change to their happiness. And if it's red, they're going to get a negative modifier to the happiness. So the important thing really is that you keep your factions happy to both increase the happiness of your pops. Happier pops will increase stability. Higher stability will give you higher outputs. And by keeping them happy, you 
increase the amount of influence generated from these factions. So at the moment I'm getting 1.5 influence from my factions, which is good. That's going to really help boost up my influence income each month. So on the other side of me, I have uh, a neighbor which will be cutting me off from expanding further west. So I'm at the moment, it will see my, my, my kind of only space that I can expand out in is this space here below me. Possibly this uh, these systems here is going to connect up to something further east, but otherwise it'll look like this is my, my kind of area. Now, this uh, species here, they are receptive and happy with me. So I could at this point form a non-aggression pact. It's going to give me a small influence cost. But the main point here is that I'm going to get some peace of mind if they accept that I'm not going to be able to go to war with them or, or them with me for at least 10 years, giving me some border security on my western side. Good, so they have accepted that. Is there anything else I can propose with them? Well, we might soon be able to propose a commercial pact. So what I'm going to do is just make them a tiny bit happier because I do want that commercial pact is I'm just going to send them some energy credits. And this, this trade acceptance value you're seeing here, that is what they are going to, is going to improve their relations by. So if they accept that this tiny deal, I sent them a few hundred energy credits, it's going to increase their happiness. And now suddenly I can form commercial pacts and research agreements. Well, let's first off start by forming a commercial pact. Now, why am I forming a commercial pact? Well, you're about to see that this is going to, in essence, this is going to be like forming a great spy network on them. So we'll form a commercial pact. Brilliant. So we've done that. And now we've been given Intel across all of their systems. And our Intel base cap has now actually gone up to 40, as you can see. Uh, even though it says here we have no Intel on them because of the commercial pact, we can see where all of their systems are. And even if we uh, lose that commercial pact, we now have information on them. And information is good. This commercial pact is also going to provide us with a small increase to energy credits and uh, also our unity because of our trade policies. Whereas for them, it will probably just increase their energy credit. We could also form a research agreement. Now, why might a research agreement be better than in the previous version of Solaris in uh, 2.8? Well, research agreements, they do provide you a buff to researching a technology that the other civilization has already researched of 25%. In addition to that, even if you have a larger research output than your neighbor, they will provide you a raw number of research points. So it can be useful to get research agreements even with less advanced civilizations just to buff up your research points by small amounts. You're basically directly converting a small amount of influence into research. Whereas before I'd recommend never doing them, at this point research agreements do have their place. But I am going to wait until my intel comes up somewhat and I can see what their technology level is at. At the moment I can't see their diplomatic weight from technology, so I don't know what their technology is like relative to mine. Though I suspect, because of the difficulty level, it's probably a bit higher than mine at the moment. So I've unlocked, uh, I've unlocked that technology, the soil remedification. Which one am I going to take next? Well, there's an important one here is planetary unification. So that one is on the administrative path. And why might I want to take that one? This is actually going to take me down a path which will unlock a whole host of technologies. For instance, it'll allow me to upgrade my planetary capital uh, with further technology advances. It'll also take me down the colonial bureaucracy path, which will first provide me a buff a bonuses to my uh, administrative capacity, which is fine. But also, colonial bureaucracy is a very important technology because it will then enable me to research encryption and decryption technologies to buff my spy network. So, planetary unification is definitely what I'm going to be taking. They have actually buffed gene clinics, something to note here. They now provide bonuses to amenities, increase in uh, pop uh, assembly speed as well as pop growth speed of 10% or 5% per job, and a 2.5% increase to your habitability on the planet. Are they worth it? I'm not sure. There are definitely situations if you have a glut of amenities on a planet, you could consider replacing your, uh, you could consider replacing the uh, the hollow theaters building with, uh, with these medical workers. However, you'd be losing unity for that, losing, if your amenities are positive, you're possibly losing a little bit of stability, but on a very large planet size, if you're at plus 30 amenities, going down to plus 20 is really not going to change your stability very much because that's uh, amenities 
bonuses to happiness scale relative to the population size. So the excess amenities have to be excess, much in great excess relative to your population. Um, so overall here, I'm not gonna take it now. I think it's definitely something to, it's worth investigating. I suspect that's probably still not worth it, but uh, but uh, you know, I could be wrong. If, uh, if you have any thoughts on this, please comment down below. But I'm gonna go with planetary unification for now. If you've been enjoying this video and other videos on my channel, please consider subscribing. It will help get my videos out to other players like you. So now I can see here what a research agreement would do because I have the required amount. So their technology is at 53, mine's at 36. It's definitely lower than theirs. And my income's probably lower too. So I can see here I would gain three, five and two base technology, which would be a nice 10 bonus, and they would gain just four. So I'm, I'm actually going to engage in a research agreement with them. That will also bring up my intel level on them, the intel cap, which uh, will let me see more of their things. Obviously to note, they're gonna be able to see more of my stuff. So here we are, we've done that, let's take a look. Yeah, so now my intel cap is at 50 on this uh, civilization next to us. Here I've just unlocked the final part of uh, the expansion tree. Let's take a look at the Ascendancy perks. So, my Ascension perks even. Which am I going to pick first? Well, at the beginning, I am not going to look at the unavailable because for now, we're just going to focus on what I can do. So this first perk is quite limited. Some of the perks require you to have picked a certain number of other perks. So your, your first choice is definitely constrained. Which of the choices are kind of the best? Which, which are really useful? Well, my first choice is almost certainly going to be technological ascendancy here. Now, what's that going to do? It's going to increase my research speed by 10% across the board, which is fantastic. That's equivalent to the bonus you get for completing the discovery tree here. So that's a really good bonus, as well as increasing the likelihood of rare technologies. And some of the rare technologies are really quite good, so I am quite happy with technological ascendancy. What else is useful? So, Interstellar Dominion, that's going to in decrease my Starbase influence cost and claim influence cost. Well, there are situations where that might be useful. Uh, at the moment, I'm producing three influence per month. I'm expanding outwards. I'm hoping to block off some of these systems down here. I'm hoping to take Intham, Dynama, and uh, Intham, and possibly Athunia if I can get there in time, but definitely Intham, Dynama, and Wazen, just so I can kind of keep hold of all this space down here at which point i'll be able to expand at my leisure the so so this this small reduction as well of 20 percent you're looking at you know that that's looking at a decrease of around uh, 12 influence something something like that 15 influence so is it worth it i would i would shy away from that next we've got one vision well one vision extra 10 percent unity that's pretty cool Minus 10% pop amenities usage and plus 50% governing ethics attraction. Well, where would this be useful? For a hive mind, this is a really good perk. So for a hive mind where you're focused on maintenance drone jobs, this is going to reduce the number of maintenance drone jobs you need because you're going to have all of your drones uh, amenity uses drop down by 10%. So you're looking there at basically in essence for every uh, 10 pops, the 11th pop will be free from an amenities point of view which should free up some of your drone pops to do other roles. So actually, from a hive mind perspective, One Vision could be as good as Technological Ascendancy, but I mean, I, I have to really rate, again, Technological Ascendancy is definitely going to be my first pick. Now, Mastery of Nature, clear block, blocker cost, minus 33%, unlock decision to permanently increase the size of our planet. Well, before 3.0.3, this was definitely a really good uh, quite a good ascension perk. This would have uh, enabled you to clear your blockers uh, at a lower cost and clearing blockers at a lower cost would enable you to increase your planetary capacity and thus by increasing planet capacity increase your growth rate. Now that we're capping growth rate at, at uh, 4.5 rather than the previous 6 this kind of pales a bit because you only need to have a planet size uh, I think I said earlier of 52 to get to your maximum growth rate. You know, you want to be comfortable in the in the in the low in the mid 60s, low 70s range, but still, uh, but still, that's not you know that's not that's not as powerful as it was for a brief period of time. Imperial prerogative, increase your administrative capacity. Never take it. 
Why would you want to increase your administrative capacity? Well, you might want to do that because you're running extra edicts. Luckily, there is a policy, uh, uh, an ascension perk which would increase our edict capacity by two, which is the equivalent of minus uh, of a minus fifty percent reduction on our uh, our empire sprawl because running two extra edicts would give you a fifty percent increase to your empire sprawl. So from that point of view. Executive figure, much better than Imperial Prerogative. Why else would we want to run it? Well, we haven't got administrative buildings. We're not employing bureaucrats. Simply employ the bureaucrats. This 20% bonus for an entire Ascension perk, you're going to get more use out of technological ascendancy than you will Imperial Prerogative. Executive vigor, that's now become a really good, uh, a really good Ascension perk. But will I be picking it first? Well, no, I'm not going to pick it first because I'm not going to really be taking... I'm not going to be taking another edict at this specific moment. The edicts I have available at the moment, I have capacity subsidies. I haven't taken that yet. I'm probably going to take that quite soon. I mean, in fact, actually, uh, I might even simply just take that now. Because what's that going to do is it's going to give me a big buff here to my technicians, which will really help my economy out. So actually, I will just do that quickly. So I've taken it and we'll just run to the end of the month. Wow, that's given me an extra plus 40 energy. I didn't have to do anything except pay the equivalent of two systems in influence. So executive figure, definitely good. Probably not worth it for your first slot as you're going to be focusing at this point. You know, you should be somewhere in the region of year, year, year 10 to, well, year 5 to 15, depending on the game speed and your and your output of unity. Uh, if you're running a build which, which does produce more unity than this empire, you'll probably get there a bit earlier. But that still being said, you're going to be spending your influence on other things. So executive figure, really good, probably not first. Transcendent learning, well, is it worth it? Not really. Increase to leader level cap, you can get that through unlocking traditions. There are different uh, tradition perks which are going to increase your leader level cap, as well as technologies and policies. Increase your leader experience gain. Well, the way that experience works is that you need an increased amount of experience to go up every level. So a 50% increase of leader experience gain doesn't equate to a 50% increase in the amount of time it takes to get to the next level, unfortunately. Uh, so, yeah, definitely wouldn't recommend Transcendent Learning. Shared Destiny, well, at this point, it's not going to be a first Ascension perk, but let's have a look at it. So, Subject Trust Cap plus 100, Subject Integration, Influence Cost minus 50%, Available Envoys plus 2. Those plus two envoys are actually really good. If later on in the game, uh, you know, when you've got the galactic community out and you're trying to increase your galactic, uh, your, your weight, those two envoys could be the difference between being able to become the uh, custodian or pass a crucial piece of legislation in the Senate and not doing that. So that's definitely something that's quite good. So just to recap then, technological ascendancy, from my point of view, Hands down, the best pick. I would take that every time out of the ones I have available here. One vision, if I was running a hive mind, there would be a case to, for taking that. Otherwise, the other ones, not really. There are a few which uh, there are a few which I would be considering taking first, but they would require me to have, for instance, if I was taking, uh, if I had Voidborn to start, I would consider, if I had Void Dwellers, I'd consider taking Voidborn. Why would I consider doing that? Well, by taking Voidborn, I'm going to increase my building slots on my habitats by two. You can't increase the building slots on habitats by building habitation districts on your habitat. So Voidborn is actually a really crucial ascension perk for Void Dwellers. That's definitely one I would look at. Eternal Vigilance, well, I, I won't have Star Fortress at the beginning. Hopefully, by the time you unlock your Ascension perk, you haven't unlocked Star Fortress yet because that would mean your Ascension perk has been really quite delayed. So probably definitely not recommending that. So that's kind of where we're at there. So let's go with Technological Ascendancy. Let's just quickly look at our technology. Well, what are we getting here? So on our technology, we're getting 51% in one category, 41% in another, and 16% in a third category. These are coming partly from our research agreements, as well as just general bonuses we're getting. That's where I'm going to leave this episode. If you've enjoyed it, please leave a like. If you've got any feedback, please leave a comment. And if you'd like to see more content like this, please subscribe. If you'd like to support this channel on Patreon, 
check out the link in the description. 